Rachel Baltazar, and I am the president of the newly minted IEHP Foundation. Um, it's a really exciting time. I mean, who would have thought even a year or two ago that this would come to be in our region, specifically for our region? Uh, so there's a lot, there's a lot of moving parts, and I'm not going to bore you with a very lengthy presentation. I just I have a couple slides, but I'd rather just kind of talk with you and and share a little bit about you know who we are and where we're at. And so I'm going to attempt to share my screen. Let's see if we cooperate today. So again, uh, thank you. Uh, I want to start off our discussion about who the foundation is by really introducing our board members. Uh, we we did a lot of, uh, of fun searching and and soul searching and trying to develop the initial foundation board to be reflective and inclusive of our community. And I think we did a pretty bang up job for the start. Uh, as you can see in that far right hand corner, we have Mr. Stephen Bennett as our board chair. And I want you to pay attention to the fact that we really try to cover all of the regions. It's a, the Inland Empire is a large geographic space, as you know, and we're in no, by no means are we done, but we needed to, we needed to get the ball rolling. So we have some representation from the high desert, uh, the, the wonderful Regina Weatherspoon Bell, uh, Josh Candelaria here in the San Bernardino area, uh, Dr. Ed Jun, uh, and Jared McNaughton, who I wish to just kind of point out, those are IEHP uh, directors that are part of our plan, which I'll talk a little more about in a moment. Uh, Dr. Jeffrey Young uh, from Riverside County, uh, as well as Dr. Conrado Barzaca, which many of you might know uh, out in the desert area, and our, our co-chair, not our, I'm sorry, sorry, co-chair, assistant chair, Karen, vice chair, Karen Scott from First Five of San Bernardino. Beautiful group of people who are on this journey with me to do some tremendous work for this entire region. So let's just talk about real quickly who, who we are. Uh, IHP Governing Board is the one who truly established this foundation uh, with a significant endowment currently in the bank, hoping to grow and, and add on to an annual basis so that we have some ongoing funding specifically for this two county region and perpetuity. We are a separate 501c3. We are our own entity with our own board designated as a public charity. We are non-Brown Act board. So our, our, our meetings are, are closed. I think the beautiful part about this is that there are no politicians on this board. This truly <laughs> is a community board, I, for a variety of reasons, I'm sure. <laughs> but I think it, it really helps to kind of take away not only the appearance, but just the ability to have the influence um, from others and their needs. And I think it's a, it's a really nice place to be. Here's our currency, another wonderful picture of our, of our great board. We That was our first meeting. I want you to understand this board is so brand new. They really did just meet for the first time in July. Uh, and we had a follow-up in October and getting ready to dig into some strategic planning um, coming into the new year. But truly this time, a lot of my time has been about building the infrastructure of this foundation. And I do mean building it for everything from office space to furniture to staff, uh, all, of, all of the technology that goes along with it when it wants to behave. Uh, but the exciting part of this is it really given us an opportunity to just learn, you know, what are other people doing around the country, around the counties, around your state? What are some best practices, uh, not just in program, uh, in programming, but also in, um, in funding? You know, what are some good strategies that people are, are using that are showing some great positive outcomes? So we've kind of called this our learning journey. Uh, and then really just getting out and meeting folks like yourselves that are uh, leading organizations, talking to community folks and, and listening. Like what, what do you find are some of the greatest needs that our region is facing? And what are some of the ideas that you have for helping move that along? So just a couple quick snapshots of some of the places and spaces that, that I've been out and about in because I just wanted you to get an idea of like, what do you mean? You know, I've been out and if you look at just from the left to right on the top, been looking at various housing models, not just um, low income, mixed rate housing uh, for the unhoused, all kinds of opportunities and models that maybe we just haven't looked at here in the Inland Empire. 
uh, in the middle. It's a workforce development center all around technology. How do we go and find fabulous spaces that industry maybe has left behind and create new opportunities and new industries uh, so that people don't need to leave their neighborhoods, that they can create something either as entrepreneurs uh, but through this space or use this space to help build and expand their businesses. I've uh, been looking at you know, preschool services, uh, food industry. You know, we do IHP as the plan. They do a lot of great work around uh, basic needs. And that's, that's truly what they're there for. We have an opportunity to take those things and go beyond that. So one of the things that I have an interest in that I'd like to showcase is how do we build industry around food, food hubs? Um, you know, using, again, going back to the entrepreneur, if you go to the, the next picture in the bottom middle, these are actually vineyards at a high school in Mead Valley in which the students are learning about agriculture and marketing and business planning and farming. And so they're raising grapes that they sell to one of the vineyards out in uh, Temecula. So students are raising a food product <laughs> that gets turned into wine. So let's make sure we clarify that. Uh, but here you have, a, you have a business that is purchasing a product. And in return, they've packaged it and they market it and they sell this wine. Uh, and the profits of that wine goes back into not only feeding this curriculum and the system, but also providing scholarships for students to go uh, to Davis or up to uh, San Luis Obispo and get trained in miniculture, coming back as, as an intern and just really bringing that industry homegrown uh, loot and closing that here in our region. Uh, and lastly, when we talk about food, oh, excuse me, uh, corner grocery stores, true grocery stores in some of our food deserts where folks have to travel outside of their community just to get fresh fruit and vegetables. And which kills me is in some of these neighborhoods are in areas of the people that actually pick our food. And so how can we start thinking differently about services and not relying on giant supermarkets to, to tell us no, that they can't come into an area that can't afford them. So right now, our foundation board is working on some strategic planning that we're gonna kick off in February. And we're truly at the point where we are going to define who we are. What is our mission? What is our vision? What are our values? And I wanted to put that there because I get asked a lot all the time, well, what's the mission of the foundation? And what are you guys gonna find? To be perfectly honest, we don't know just yet. You know, we are taking this time to really listen and learn, and not just from community members, from partners, also other funders. You know, I'm really interested in what, you know, community foundation is looking at over the next generation. What is San Manuel looking at? And in having those conversations, we're starting to see that there might be uh, some synergy and that we can either collaborate and really leverage each other's funding. Um, I love those discussions because I think we can go farther, further, or further, farther uh, together. I mean, we need to we need to collaborate. We've not always done that very well in this region, um, and I think it it starts from from the treetops as well as grassroots. So after we define our mission, vision, and values, we're going to figure out what are going to be our funding priorities. What are those fine tuned areas that we are really going to focus on? You and I both know that the IE has a lot of need and we could get lost in a sea of need, but we really need to figure out what are we going to stand for and what are we going to concentrate on, whether that's for the first three to five years or for a generation. Uh, and once we do that, we can start crafting our strategies. And lastly, we got to fund. We've got to get some money out there and start funding some transformation in our communities. And I'm going to leave my contact information there for you in case you'd like to call me anytime. I like I said, the, the presentation part, I wanted to, um, to say just really quickly because I'd rather have some more discussion with you, but I'm really interested in meeting folks that I've never met before, organizations that I'm not familiar with, um, and being able to share that and bring that back and start to see who's doing what where, because what I love to do is figure out like, wow, you know, Work with Elvia is doing this. Are, are they connected with you know, such and such group out in Morongo Valley. Like those are the things that that light me up. Um, and so I'm hoping to do a lot more of that. So if I haven't had a chance to meet you or come see your organizations, please, please send me a note. I'd love to. And I'm, I'm kind of 
hoping that in the next few months, I might be able to press upon my board chair, Stephen, <clears throat> to maybe have a, a host, host me for a day or two, just to come out and meet the organizations. You guys are all spread out, but if there's a few of you that are in a certain region, that'd be great to come out and, and meet with you and, and see you in your, in your home space. So I'm gonna stop there for a second and try to open it up for questions. I think um, all of the board members will be glad to help host you in their region, whether it's the high desert or uh, the or the west uh, part of the region, uh, because I think um, you getting to meet people and hear them is really important. I think one of the things that uh, Angel is saying also is that uh, we're going to be able to give money that is the profit from our investments. We cannot touch the corpus of the gifts from the health plan. So part of the reason we have to work on all of the infrastructure and strategy is we have some time because we got to make some profit from that money. So we'll have something to give away. Uh, and so it's not like we're holding back. I think Angel and the board are very willing to start uh, funding stuff as soon as we know what we really our focus is and as soon as we have enough money to do it so I have a lot of people ask me about you know when are you going to start funding stuff and it's going to start slow you know and hopefully by the spring or summer we'll really be able to do some little funding and get started but it's going to take a little while to build up the revenue uh, that we can get our hands on to uh, create uh, grants and funding for projects so be patient with us. We're on our way. And hopefully, uh, I know Angel and the board are very interested in making sure that we build a strong organization that grows over time and becomes a great asset here in this community. It's just really a pleasure to be here. And I see some familiar faces and names. So um, it's it's great to be amongst friends. And it's always great to follow um, Angel Baltazar. She's just, and we're so excited to have her and her leadership um, in the Inland Empire um, Health Plan Foundation. I, I just am really excited about the energy and I think the foresight and the connectivity that, that Angel sees and her leadership is just so welcome. So um, with that, um, I'm definitely Adora Stephen. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I, I love this work and many of you that have known me know that I've been doing this for a long time. And, and it's really, you know, one of the things that I found, although I don't wanna, I, please, I'm not minimizing data by any um, stretch of the word, um, but, you know, we've done community health needs assessments for a long time. And often, you know, I, I, I started working in hospitals when I was 16. So um, always, you know, had that community health perspective, um, having a public health training. And, but then, you know, really seeing the hospital in the four walls. So yeah, I've spent my entire career trying to build, you know, get hospitals to go outside the four walls of the hospital and really connect. And um, never have before have I seen the opportunity that's in front of us right now for so much connectivity. So as I present the community health assessment, I want you to, you know, really think about it in terms of a really global, um, you know, a global view of how we're thinking about health and well-being, because it's not healthcare, it's not public health, it's really this new ecosystem of community health and well-being, and we're defining that and working on that, and there's so much intersection that you can all see, so, you know, how are health systems working with um, public health and working with all of you, because you guys are the secret sauce, um, really, to, um, you know, you know, impacting health in our communities, and I'll, and I'll share that. So, um, Stephen, I just want to do a time check, because I don't want to talk too long, because I always hate people that do that. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's look at doing about 20 to 25 minutes. Okay. So, and Perfect. then we'll have time for some discussion. Perfect. And I, I want to welcome um, you guys. I, I think I can see when I share my screen, but feel free to, to, to stop and ask questions um, because this is really for you guys. And, and a part of, you know, as I present the, the community health assessment, um, you know, just know that this is really the, you know, my whole point about the data is that it's not about the data. It's about the collective ownership and what we call civic muscle and belonging. And the more that we can all engage in this and that, you know, health belongs to all of us 
and create that that ecosystem of what I call what we're going to talk about as stewardship, the more successful we're going to be. So I'm ready for some transformation in our communities. I've lived in the Inland Empire for over 30, um, you know, 33 years. My husband and I raised our children here. I'm a native of Southern California. And so just really love this community and, and excited to see the, the next chapter of the Inland Region. So thank you all for your, com your commitment and your ongoing work to this. So I am going to share my screen, Stephen. And let's see here. Let's. Let's make sure I have no technical difficulties. Everyone can see, we're all good? Okay, very good. Um, and then I will, Angel, you'll yell at me if someone has their hand up or has a question because um, they don't have my chat and my participant open. So, um, but again, um, as Stephen mentioned, this was really a collaboration. My company is HC2 Strategies. So health, um, HC, HC2 stands for Healthy Connected Communities. So I've always, um, you know, built on the premise that um, it's the connections and communities that are really the currency. And so my company is built on that. And um, IHP um, was really, I, I think, um, a forefront in, in leading what we're calling um, Vibrant Inland Empire. So we did a, we, the hospitals all have to do a, a CHNA for some of the um, Affordable Care Act requirements. So we did that, but we also brought them in and brought in what we did, a larger community health assessment so that we were bringing in other um, sectors into, you know, the, the, the conversation to ensure that we're not just thinking about healthcare, because the problem with healthcare, and I can say this, I've worked in healthcare a long time, the financial model is really dying and you'll see that. And, you know, it really is, how are we connecting in community and really looking at socially complex communities and how do we address that? California is now um, investing in what we're calling CalAIM, a California advancing and innovating Medi-Cal more dollars than I've ever seen in my entire career. This is a moment in time to look at transformation. So um, happy to happy to answer any of those questions. Um, I've been working with managed care plans all around the state and also with Department of Healthcare Services around CalAIM. So if you have any questions um, about how this ties in, um, feel free to, to chime in. But again, you know, what I wanna do today is, you know, I've already done that kind of talking about the purpose, but really thinking about doing the work. When Jared, the CEO of IHP, I said, I won't do a CH, I won't do a CHNA if it's just about data. And trust me, we have more data than you'll ever want. <laughs> we have lots of data, but it's about that stewardship and collective action. How do we own the data and what do we do with it? Um, because we can study data until we're blue in the face and no one gets served. So the real purpose about this and, and what we hope is so, is so different is that it's really um, to, a data to action. And what we're calling it the vibrant inland empire, because it's just not about health. It's about the creative economy. It's about the workforce. It's about um, all of us working together to really, you know, what are the conditions that we all need? Um, and and, I'll, and I'm, not, I'm not promoting Kaiser, but what do we all need to thrive? you know, starting with those that are struggling and suffering and how do we um, get everyone in our community to thrive, no exceptions. And that um, ensures that we're not, um, you know, marginalizing any communities and leaving anyone out, that this is about an inclusive community. And so um, we'll, we'll share kind of the framework that we look not only at the disease processes, because typically what happens is we'll, um, you know, it, hospitals or, you know, people that are tasked with health look at the disease state. But, you know, when we talk about upstream, what are the community conditions or the social conditions or, you know, some of the behaviors that are causing the diseases in the first place? So what we've created, um, we've worked with um, the, um, you know, lots of federal agencies in a framework, what we're calling vital conditions. So we'll talk a little bit about that. What are the priority populations and how do we um, move forward together? So um, what, you know, really what this was based on is, that that notion of togetherness, <laughs> because we really need to do this together. And how can we have a unifying narrative and measurable expectations? Like I said, all people and places across the Inland Empire are thriving together, no exceptions. And that really is the premise of what we're trying to do. And then how do we, you know, not only look at narrow projects or technical fixes, not that, you know, we all don't have our own purview and, um, you know, uh, work that we need to do, but how can we think and act differently as a more of a collective? 
that doesn't mean we all have to do the same thing, but how are we working in an ecosystem? So what, what we're calling um, interdependent stewards in a movement for well-being, equity, and racial justice. So really thinking about, you know, our, our systems weren't built on um, the notion um, for everyone to thrive. They really weren't. And, you know, you often see that. And so how do we think differently and move towards, you know, transformation in a different way so that individuals and organizations in every sector really see themselves as interdependent stewards? And so, like I said, who's doing this work? All of us. And you guys are key critical components. I look at it kind of the, the triangle, healthcare, public health and social services, and community-based organizations. You guys have the pulse of our communities. Um, you know, you're the ones that have the, the knowledge, the community wisdom to really be a part of the, the ecosystem responsible for improving the conditions. It's, um, you know, working with all of us and figuring out how we can get people to go from struggling and suffering to thriving. So all of us can be stewards. And so thinking about that, that it, it is, um, you know, that kind of that civic muscle and belonging. Um, I see someone chat something, Angel. Is that a question? Yes, they were asking if the slides would be available. Absolutely. I'll happy to share them with Mihai. So did I say that right, Mihai? Yes. Yeah. And the recording okay. will be as well. Okay, perfect. Um, and then, um, so collective action, you know, how do we work together and invest, um, you know, it, in this work differently? So um, you'll see a theme. And then, um, you know, thinking about really a balanced portfolio, often when we invest, it's about urgent services. You know, we all have, you know, homeless shelters or emergency rooms or, you know, um, you know, uh, transitional or crisis stabilization units. And, and I don't mean to minimize any of that. But then also, how do we invest in what we're calling a well-being economy so that we get ahead of this, so that we can begin to think about um, you know, our uh, balanced investments in our community. So we're not just constantly responding to crisis and the immediate need. And so that is really important that we're thinking about this in, in terms of, of collective action and also thinking about how we are working towards what we call multi solvers. And multi solvers is, um, you know, are really things that, you know, that improve health, improve, um, you know, health and well-being. Um, often community, community health workers are, are, are touted as a, a multi-solver, but there's many of them. So how are we thinking about addressing community conditions with those multi-solvers and how do we surface those together so that we can invest so we're not competing, but we're actually enhancing and working as inter interdependent stewards. So this is the, um, we have a website um, for, with, with the data um, that we did with the Community Health Needs Assessment. It's called Vibrant Inland Empire, and i um, happy to share that um, with all of you. It's an online platform, and it's actually interactive, so you can look at the different um, you know, areas of the community and you can pull down the available data. And we have probably over 150 indicators specifically for the Inland Empire around burdens of disease and vital conditions. So I promise you data was not minimized in any way, shape or form, but it was how do we use data for collective action? And, you know, the point being is that, you know, there's so many things happening. The Inland Empire Community Foundation is thriving. Angel's launching the, the Inland um, Empire Health Plan Foundation. Um, you know, UCR is working on a, a roadmap. You know, you have IE Rise, IE Go. All of these are great things, but how do we, you know, really in, ensure that they're interconnected and as the outside world is all wants to invest in the Inland Empire, that we're creating a platform for us all to thrive, that it's just not segmented. Um, so really knowing that there's some real opportunities, but also threats for us to be kind of, I always say spreading the peanut butter. <laughs> if we're if we're spreading the peanut butter too thin, are we really having the dose intensity and duration that we really need to invest in our communities and the things that matter? So um, again, this is the, the Vibrant um, process, the Vibrant Inland Empire. Here is the website and you guys will have that. So you're free to look at that. And we wanna hear back from you because this is an iterative process. We wanna grow it. We wanna see this as our data platform so that we can democratize a lot of the data. Um, and it was really fun. We also pulled in some hospital utilization data. So, um, you know, like the avoidable emergency room department visits, 
along with some housing, employment, and a lot of data. So I promise you, you will not lack for any data. We had a, you know, this was our starting committee. Our hope is that we grow this. And um, what we'd like to do is what we're having, you know, what we're calling stewards, stewardship circles that we're not controlling or, or overseeing anything, but we're really helping to find some common language, a common narrative, um, and, and really expanding how we're thinking about growing in the Inland Empire in a more holistic way. So we hope that we can add you guys to some of the stakeholder committee or that we can really figure out how we're interconnecting a lot of things that are happening. Um, we, you know, we all have to prioritize because we can't do everything, although, you know, we were and the vital conditions were really designed to look at multi solvers. But just so you guys know, we went through a process, did some prioritization, and these were the things that came out um, pretty unified across the entire region cardiovascular disease and diabetes, mental health, mental and behavioral health, and maternal and infant health, which is um, that's my background. That's always a you know, gives me pause because um, you know, that's so important, and you know, we have a lot of disparities in our infant and maternal health. And there had been a lot of work that had been done on that. So really hoping that we can start with our kids and really help improve the health and well-being of our um, you know, mothers and children. Um, I'm seeing more chats in there, Angel. Do I need to stop or are those just comments? Okay, all right, you'll, you'll stop me. I should know better. Um, <laughs> and, then, um, and then the vital conditions. And I'll talk a little bit about these, but some of the, you know, um, I think what everyone really galvanized around were basic needs for health and safety, and I'll explain that a little bit more, humane housing and meaningful work and wealth. So these were, in a sense, the burdens of disease and the vital conditions that unanimously everyone, uh, hospitals, you know, social, the first five um, social services, community-based organizations all agreed that these were priorities in our community. And then, so I, I just want to just go briefly over the vital conditions. So this is a framework. It's actually, um, they, they just had a, the um, HHS just had a um, webinar on this. Um, they, they're they using, this is, you know, we've talked about social determinants of health and, you know, the county health rankings. The vital conditions is now being used by 43 federal agencies for the long-term recovery and resiliency for social behavior and community health. So they've all galvanized around this framework. And, um, you know, it's it, it really was designed to look at how communities can um, work together. Um, and so these were the conditions, reliable transportation, thriving in a natural world. It was, again, some environmental issues around climate change, so that there is not polarizing language, regardless of what your political affiliation is, that, you know, we can all agree that, you know, the, 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 the environment impacts your health. <laughs> And how can we address that together? Um, basic needs and safety, and there's you know key indicators in that framework: housing, work, and meaningful wealth, and lifelong learning. And then really having um, belonging and civic muscle at the center. And that's where you know we talk about this stewardship model that um, you know this this really needs to be at the center of the vital conditions because this is about the capacity and and really looking at ensuring that everyone is thriving without any. Um, you know, any exceptions. So happy to share, you know, some links on that. I encourage you guys to look at that because you're going to hear a lot more about it. And you're also going to see 43 federal agencies aligning around this, this, this um, framework. And so, you know, moving towards action then, you know, what we're really trying to do is as we, you know, I have identified what those priorities are, how do we now go from, you know, a transactional, which we know that there needs to be some transactional work, but really to more of a transformational. And you guys have probably all seen the FSG, you know, how do you change systems, you know, through policies, resource flows. Um, but one of them is mental models and power, you know, and relationships and, and power and connections. And so, you know, as we're thinking about coming out of COVID and really trying to do their, you know, the recovery and resiliency, how are we thinking about kind of this transformational model where um, we have a, a shared stewardship, you know, that thriving is that, is that North Star for the systems that we're going to build out of COVID. So that we're really thinking about well-being and justice for everyone, not a system that's designed to, to benefit just a few. And so really thinking about 
um, you know, how are we um, looking at our processes, the power opportunities and outcomes for this work and for, um, you know, the, you know, the investments that we make in our region so that they're not just transactional and that we're thinking about more of a balanced portfolio. And so there's really, you know, what, what we're really hoping is to, to shape this ecosystem of a unifying narrative. How can we tell stories and make cases showing how we can thrive together versus that we're fighting against each other, bridge across differences, whether that's workforce, community-based organizations, healthcare, how do we connect across those intersecting differences? I know I, you know, like I said, I've worked in healthcare, and but I'm a doctor of public health. Um, people have often said, oh, Dory, when I work for the hospitals, I go to the dark side. It's like, no, we're all in this together and we all need to figure out how we can bridge those differences. And then most importantly, really thinking about identifying the language for multi-solving investments and really investing in those. So as we're thinking about, you know, just, you know, new tranches of dollars, whether it's with Calane, with our foundations, or with, you know, a lot of the infrastructure dollars, how can we ensure that we're investing where there's co-benefits, especially looking at um, belonging and civic muscle? And then I promise I don't want to forget data. How are we measuring? You know, how are we measuring the movement? And, and also identifying what our North Star is and not being too granular, but really looking at um, what is it that we want to move? Everyone wants to move the dial. Well, you know, we're not going to decrease homelessness next week. Um, and, you know, we really need to think about how are we measuring the movement so that we are getting traction, we are having feedback, and we're moving forward. Um, I don't think I need to share with any of you that there's um, populations that are disproportionately impacted in our region by poor health. Um, this, we've known this for over 50 years. I mean, and, you know, this was just confirmed that obviously those that are living in low incomes or remote and rural communities, um, you know, communities of color, and then also our seniors. We have a lot of low income seniors, um, especially, um, you know, we found some really uh, glaring disparities in um, older African American uh, males and then our um, Black infant mortality, which is really just, and, and also in the Native American population. So lots of work to do um, to get to everyone thriving. And so as we think about um, next steps, um, you know, one, thank you, Stephen, because you, you are just having me here today and having this conversation is promoting community stewardship, acknowledging the synergies and collaboration um, opportunities and then how do we coordinate investments aligned to priorities and, and data that we're, that we're looking at? Um, we want to spotlight pace setters. So there's actually a link here on, on um, the, that, that um, online platform where we want to share. There's great stuff happening in our region. Um, let's spotlight you. Let's not always hear about the negative, but let's hear about the amazing work that's going on and let's spotlight those because we often they they often don't get heard. And you know, as they're growing and innovating, we want to make sure that we're giving them life and giving them space. Um, you know, how do we chart progress with measurement, learning, and evaluation? And then how do we expand our platforms so that we're building capacity and really beginning to exchange the resources that are available and that we're not fighting against them, but we're, you know, we're not fighting over a few million dollars, but we're creating an ecosystem for billions of dollars in the Inland Empire because we're long overdue and it's time. And all of you are part of that. So Stephen, did I do good? I'm going to pause there. And uh, oh my goodness. Oh yeah. <laughs> you, you, I've never, I've seen you do this once. I've never imagined you could get through all this stuff so quickly. <laughs> It was fabulous. I have a couple of just big questions sure. and, then, and I'm uh, stop audience, uh, get ready to ask some questions. But one is, you know, um, I spent many years on the on the board of the California Endowment where we've spent millions of dollars studying this. And yep. I'm kind of wondering with the other groups that I've worked with, that how, how did, did you include or um, engage with uh, California Wellness or California Endowment or some of the big health systems like Eisenhower and Loma Linda and um, other health plans in the region, Desert Regional, were they all part of this as well? because I, I didn't see them listed. I didn't recognize names. Yeah, so um, with the California Endowment, California Wellness, not directly, you know, that we did have people that had, you know, um, relationships with them, um, but we absolutely did include the, the, some of the health systems. Um, this was 
um, the, the, so Loma Linda was included, um, you know, we had Kaiser, we had Common Spirit, we had, you know, some of the smaller hospitals. I don't know if we had anyone from Eisenhower, Stephen, but that doesn't mean that they were excluded and we want to include them and pull them in. One of the outcomes of, um, of, you know, the community health needs assessment will be uh, all the hospitals are actually going to work together to uh, look at addressing mental health. So even if they weren't included in some of the initial, that doesn't mean that, you know, that we want to close the door and we want to include them and bring them in for in some of those different work groups. So um, hospital association and communities lifting communities will be pulling together all the health systems in January. Okay, great. I mean, I, I, I think of um, a lot of these systems, they're not just hospitals. They spend tons of time assessing the community and figuring out how to do this. So they had so much information and the endowment literally spent maybe $10 million a year studying the region. Right. And so I, I, um, and I, and I get a different picture from the endowment than I'm getting from this, by the way. Interesting. Can yeah. you share what are some of the what are some of the differences? Sure, sure. They they look at a thirty year goal. Oh, okay. And, and they look at health in a maybe a broader way, uh, in the sense that uh, they're trying to they they think uh, after their ten year experience with the uh, better uh, health uh, project, which they did all over the state was uh, what they see is that the real core is getting individual people, I'm going to be really basic here, I'm going to ruin this, but getting individual people everywhere to feel like that they have a sense of self, a sense of belonging, and a sense of engagement with the community, and then people will change. Yeah, well, but in a and sense, so that's... A very long, and I understand, but you're talking about disease-specific, you're also talking about uh, uh, three strategies, and I and and I think they're saying that one of the things we have to do is instead of just having a group of smart people do analysis and and talking about it, we need to empower people to bring solutions forward over a long period of time, and and which includes everything you're talking about. I, I don't mean this in any way as a criticism. I just think it's no, no. Interesting conversation that, you know, I think we all ought to be having. And I know, um, you know, a lot of these big health systems and definitely health plans spend a fortune on this kind of stuff. Yeah. And so I, I, I'm feeling a little bit like, are we reinventing the wheel? Are we really engaging everybody who's been studying and looking at this for a long time? Uh, it was an impressive list of people, but I, 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 I see it as, as, some kind of a little different spin. And I, I'm, I'm just going to put it out there. I'm partly playing the devil's advocate just a touch so I can get people in this audience talking a little bit because I think this is really healthy. A Angel, quit laughing. <laughs> <laughs> I did want to add real quickly, I just messaged Stephen to let him know that in the beginning of this process, at the time I was working at San Antonio Regional Hospital. So I do know that every hospital and health system in the region had been invited and, and shared with, you know, like this is what we're talking about, you know, trying to work together. And many have their own very strict schedules of when they do their own community health needs assessment and the way they do it. And so they they just did their own. And so it didn't mean that they didn't want anything to do with this. They just didn't actively participate because they were busy doing their own thing. And they came back because this got started pretty quickly, Stephen, and asked if they can be a part of it. So I, I you know, I do think. But I agree. You know, I think it's the stewardship model and that civic muscle and belonging that I was trying to say is really the core. So but I'll I would love to hear from I would love to hear others as you've poked it a little bit. Great. I have one other question I'd love for you to uh, address, and that is I know a lot of the folks on the screen today and I know a lot of them are doing incredible stuff. Mm -hmm. And I look at Calane and I look at where CMS and the way they're changing the way uh, funding is coming into the community in a much more expanded way. There's things that a lot of these folks have been doing for years they've never got funded for. And I would love if you could address for just a moment 
And, and I'm, I'm talking about everything from disability services to food programs, uh, you know, where you're educating parents on how uh, the well-being of their child who has a disability, uh, uh, um, uh, community health workers. I actually think all of these people could get funded through Cal AIM these days. Uh, so many of them. And do you have any recommendation or advice for some of these people who've been doing this kind of work about how to access, access this kind of sustainable funding? I do. And I also saw someone had their hand up and um, also, you know, the community knows what the community needs and amen to that. And, and that was the whole premise of the stewardship. You know, it's like, let's empower our communities to um, address what they need. I couldn't agree more. But Stephen, back to the so this the Department of Healthcare Services just uh, launched what they're calling um, Cal AIM Path Collaborative Planning Initiatives. And um, I'm embarrassed I don't have the um, the link, but I'll get it before before I stop talking here. Um, and they are launching in January, and the Institute for Healthcare Improvement will be facilitating those for the Inland Empire. And so those are designed exactly to look at how do we build the capacity for Cal AIM distribution and dollars. So because there's multiple funding through Cal AIM, it's the incentive payment programs through IHP and Molina. It's the um, what we're calling HHIP dollars, so those are the homeless and housing incentive plans. And then there's the cited dollars, which are coming down from the state. And then there's behavioral health dollars. So there is like insane amount of money that's coming down. And to your point, how do we make sure that we're all working together and that we're creating the, the um, you know, I think the baskets to receive this dollars for systems change. So, uh, and I'll get that um, that uh, website. And But I see Carolina has a, her hand up. Oh, someone's put it on. Okay, I'm gonna get the PATH website too. Carolina, we'd love to hear from you. You're on mute, Carolina. I thought I clicked it. Hi, thank you. Thank you, Dora. My name is Carolina and I'm with the Happier Life Project. Thank you so much for that presentation. We're a recovery community organization uh, in Riverside County that provides non-clinical peer-based recovery support services. Uh, we focus on the eight dimensions of wellness, and I like everything that you presented that, that aligns with, with everything that we do. And it's interesting what you're bringing up about all this funding that's coming in. We are also part of a grantee. Uh, we're, we're grantees to Department of Healthcare Services called the EPOC grant, which was to expand the peer workforce uh, mm -hmm. that, you know, that has been growing here with that Cal AIM and all of that. However, we've been met with a barrier in the sense of we are non-clinical and we are not attached to the county. We are not attached to any behavioral health system. We do not diagnose. However, we go through the same training that all the other peer support workers do, and yet we don't qualify for any of that funding. And first and foremost, I mean, for the Medi-Cal billable service, right? We are in community. There's a continuum of community care that needs to keep happening out of these systems that, you know, that, that bog everything down, you know, that are great and everything, but we continue and carry on and still trying to figure out where do we fit into all of this, working with CAMPRO, um, Cal Mesa, you know, just all these different grants that are coming in mm -hmm. and I'm sitting at the table and all these different funding streams and we're all talking the same conversation. And I'm like, why aren't we all together, divvy up the money, whoever needs to get it and have the same conversation in one place? Yeah. How do we make that happen? Yeah, Caroline, I just, I, I feel like I have a magic wand today because I just put a, mm -hmm. a, a link in the, in the chat Okay, and this is to sign up for the PATH Collaborative Planning Initiatives. You can, um, and in my company, one of the things that we're doing in 21 other counties is actually doing these conversations and helping organizations just like yours become ECM or community support providers through um, the health plans. And, and they're dying for you, Carolina. This is where my, they're dying. They need you because this is a new structure. These are new systems. These are new resource flows. And we just worked with tribal providers because to your point, they didn't know how to become um, ECM, or we're calling ECM, I hate acronyms, I'm sorry, enhanced care management and community support providers. You can do that. Um, and they will help you do that. And then you can access those dollars. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that link. I did want to bring up one of our biggest, most successful programs right now is our family groups, our family support groups for those that are family members and concerned significant others that have people that are struggling with mental health or substance use disorders. 
that's mm-hmm. been the one that's been like the biggest right now. And we, we are helping with other uh, tribes, you know, two other uh, tribes to create recovery community organizations on the reservation, as well as um, our Spanish speakers. Yep. And why like even any of the trainings that we have with this whole new workforce, nobody was mandated to provide it in Spanish. Nobody by the state of California. That's not okay in California or anywhere for that matter, but just working on those initiatives on trying to make a, a systematic change that needs to happen from top you know, from the top. Yep. And this is your time. And this is, you know, it's like we have to organize around it and, um, you know, and really, you know, get the funding to you guys. This is key. Great advocacy, Caroline. I love that. Uh, Other folks have uh, questions for Dora or comments? I just, I have a quick comment. Um, My name's Angelica Mondragon and I'm coming in as a community advocate and a resident, well, former resident of San Bernardino County. I grew up there. Um, And now I work in research. I work actually in Seattle, Washington at the Latino Center for Health in policy. And I think it's so crucial to kind of picking up, picking back off of Carolina, it's so crucial to have that um, community and also research advocacy happening in tandem. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dora, you have all the language and all of the uh, the connections to the different policies coming downstream and the different initiatives coming downstream and, and having people like Carolina and, and I know many of us on this call are also advocates in our communities and, and just having more of that um, collaboration and potentially even having it funded through the state of California, making it um, mandatory for not just cabs to exist, but also to really incentivize mm-hmm. community members to give their perspectives and to partner with um, research institutions or centers that are focused on addressing social determinants of health. So really working together on a lot of these initiatives, but then also, again, to Stephen's point, bringing the money back to the community because they know what they need. Exactly. Angelica, can I, can I just ask a question to that? Because you're so spot on and, you know, and, and I think kind of a readiness, um, you know, because it's like this never before. I've done this for over 30 years and never have I had funding. I used to have to pass the hat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> True. Um, I'm just curious, you know, what, what would, you, you know, cause we propose these, what we're calling stewardship circles and it's just, you know, to prepare for what's coming and to find language and to connect the dots and, you know, would that be useful or what would you think would, what would be a, an action item to address what you're talking about? Well, um, Coalition building is really essential. I think part of it is also going back to the legislation and having direct contact with legislators who are passing bills. I mean, I'm, we're, we're doing this in the state of Washington. The Latino population is less than a million and a half, and yet there's so much community, community advocacy and also coalition building, and we're in direct communication with those legislators. So that's one possible way, but I'm curious to know what others think. I, I, oh, I think, sorry. I just wanted to say, uh, having my daughter gotten her PhD at the University of Washington, they're very much in touch with what's going on in Washington state. Um, and it is a smaller state. Um, it's, I think it's much harder, but I think that what, what you're talking about is really important Uh, here in California, and hopefully we can take that into account and proceed, you know, at least piece by piece with what you're doing. Terrific. Uh, um, uh, I see Carolina's uh, got her hand raised. Do you want to, please go ahead. 
Sorry, I don't want to monopolize any conversation, but I I have a lot, you know, um, to to say. Um, so if, please jump in, everybody. Um, but one one of the things that I've noticed uh, that has come up, like as a barrier, is we are so large as a state, California. I mean, Riverside County alone, two point five million, right? I look at models like Arkansas, and again, I'm 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 following the model of the peer support. That's what I'm speaking to. I'm in recovery, long term recovery myself, so that's my focus: mental health and substance use in this whole ecosystem um, is I look at states like Arkansas that have a beautiful model and the way they laid it out. And I'm like, oh, but they're almost the size of just this county. Mm -hmm. So um, and every county has a different system. And so that keeps to come up when people are trying to help us. It's like, oh, wait, but it's like you guys are like 58 states in one state. So that becomes like a bigger feat for people uh, to take on and, and, and assist in the way these systems roll out, as well as the the reparation of the harm that's already been done. Like, where does that come? And I'm speaking, for example, with Native, Native Americans, right? I'm also Native American and working with those populations and some grants that we've been afforded to be able to do that. They're like, what are you going to do? Come ask us a bunch of questions again. We're going to tell you what we want. You're going to bring us a program that doesn't even match what it is. And then it's going to go away in a year. So go away. I don't get that exact verbiage, but that's where the community is coming from. So it's like, okay, yes, the community knows what they need, but there's also a distrust in how we go in there and get this information as well to be able to um, make it what it is uh, about us. So last night, we had a listening session together with Campro. What's working, what's not working, and we were in Hemet. I did so much um you know, distributing of flyers, you know, chamber of commerce, rotary club, businesses, all this stuff. And it's like, you know, three people show up. And so it's like pulling the resources of like a framework, you know, from up down, like help us. There's leaders in every community that are passionate about this work. Like where is the, the, the training and the framework instead of just here's some money and let us know what you need. No, People already know how to make this go, like help us in that process of building the community and rising up leaders of exactly where we're at in the different areas. I think that um, is, is super important because there's a lot of people that want to help and they just don't know how. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I want to point out that uh, uh, Debbie Cannon's here and Debbie runs Academy Go and they actually do great work in training on fundraising and grant writing. And uh, I, I'm listening to you and, and I'm thinking, you know, where do people actually go to get trained to, to meet all these requirements and to approach donors and all this stuff? Well, I, I mean, we do training, but we send our staff to Academy Go uh, because Debbie's got a great program there. And I want to point out that this a tool that Dora brought on um, the um, all of the data, the, I think it's the Vibrant Inland Empire uh, site. I mean, that's a gold mine when you're writing grants and contracts. Go there, use that data because it will make your case along with the stories, Carolina, that you can say so clearly. You attach it to the data. Even when you're writing a contract with the state, you want to be able to tell the story and have the data. And so, and 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 also obviously with other types of donors and grant makers. So that's a huge resource. And I wanna encourage everybody to take a look at it and think about using it every time they have to write a grant. And, and uh, there are resources in the community for technical assistance and um, uh, fundraising and grant writing and contract writing. And, and Academy Go is one great source for that along with the work we try to do at Caravanserai Project. Um,